Thank you for joining us on this uh, uh, special episode of um, Natural Pigments. And we're going to be talking about, will lead white soon be unavailable? And it's a little bit of an ominous um, title for this discussion, but I think it's very important uh, that we address this and make uh, our customers and in the general public aware of what is happening with lead white, because many of you probably have uh, tried to order lead white, not only from natural pigments, but from other companies and found that it's not available, it's out of stock. And there's uh, perhaps very little explanation been given for this. And I felt it would be very important to provide an explanation because lead white after all is a very important color for artists who are painting in oils. And the discussion, and this is just a really informal type of discussion, I prepared a, a few things um, so that uh, visually, so that you can uh, help understand some of, the, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but the discussion is going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research into lead white recently. Uh, in the past two, um, um, about 20, 30 years, and uh, some important things that we need to note about uh, lead white. And in addition to that, then I'll talk about the, the industry overall. And I also want to talk a little bit about the history of uh, how lead white is made. And, uh, and then we have some good news, too, uh, at towards the end of, uh, of this uh, episode. So uh, let's... Um, Let's start off with a little presentation that, that I've prepared here for you. And we're going to be addressing recent changes in the availability of lead white. And, but what's the importance of lead white? Why do, we, why do we talk about it so much? And especially with natural pigments, you know that we emphasize the importance of lead white in oil painting. And I need to emphasize that fact. We're talking about its importance in relation to oil painting. Uh, it, the importance in relation to other painting mediums, it, it doesn't have the same importance uh, because it doesn't have the same uh, properties in other painting mediums. But what has been noted, and, and this is based on, on scientific research studies that have been done, and, and what we can observe in paintings that are hundreds and hundreds, centuries old, that properly formate, formulated cured oil paint films are remarkably stable uh, polymer systems lasting hundreds of years. And we've noticed this, we, we see this. We see this in paintings of the early Netherlandish uh, artists who were painting uh, in the uh, 14th, 15th centuries. And the condition of their paintings is quite remarkable. And many of them needed practically no intervention until uh, the 20th century, so 500 years later. So this is a remarkable thing because we don't see this with many other painting mediums uh, today, <clears throat> excuse me, today in, <clears throat> excuse me, in museums and, um, and uh, about. So, so that is a, a very important piece of information. And there is, there is, at this point in time, we do not see any other pigment that has the same properties in oil paint. And that's an important thing to note. Lead-containing paints made from lead white uh, have noteworthy stability. And that's really the key point of using lead white in oil paint today, despite its uh, uh, toxicity. And the toxicity is, of course, an issue. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but for professional artists, we believe that it's very important to use lead, uh, lead white especially, in paintings, um, despite its toxi toxicity. And uh, but it, artists are able to really prevent being exposed to the toxicity of lead white. It's it's quite simple with basic studio hygiene. And despite their longevity, lead-containing oil paints tend to form soaps, and this has been recognized for uh, well over, probably 100 years, uh, that the, the soaps, which are a, a chemical combination of the metallic lead with the components in oil, form soap. And to form a soap, we 
as we learned probably in grade school, uh, the soap is formed using a fat and, a, and an alkali. And so combining them forms a soap. So, and the same thing happens with metals, certain types of basic metals, and uh, they form soaps when they're combined with oils. And this has been repeatedly measured over and over again. The metal soaps can play both a positive role as anchor points during the paint drying, which leads to the maturing of the oil paint system and, and its, its stability, but has also been responsible for certain degradation pro processes. And this is really uh, what has been noted in, in the last uh, couple of decades, that Lead, lead soaps can also lead to certain types of degradation products. These products include uh, protrusions from in the paint film. Um, they include darkening, which is as a result of the increased transparency of the paint, as well as uh, other effects. Um, but I have to emphasize too that a lot of the uh, a lot of these adverse effects or these degradation processes are not just caused by uh, lead. Uh, they're also caused by zinc, and in a few more rare cases, by other types of, of uh, um, soaps, uh, such as calcium soaps, and uh, even more rare are copper soaps. So, um, so I need to emphasize that, that not all the, the uh, information that we read, and you're probably, uh, if, if you, uh, are part of the Painting Best Practice group on, on Facebook. You're probably aware of a lot of these information because we, we try to bring this to the forefront and make artists aware of, uh, of both the advantages and sometimes their disadvantages in using certain materials. What's interesting, in a paper recently which uh, talks, uh, the, the paper is entitled Lead Soaps in Paintings, Friends or Foes, it, uh, it analyzed uh, the number of scientific publications reporting on the origins and roles of metal soaps in paintings. And um, in the top graph, they, this, is, this is from that particular uh, study, uh, they showed the number of papers, um, and if you look in the green area, they, they show that, uh, that the lead soaps or I should say metal soaps in general, okay? So this is not only lead, but also zinc and other soaps have positive roles and, uh, and then in red have negative roles and some papers identified the, uh, that they have both roles, both positive and negative. And some of the papers in the gray um, showed that there was uh, a neutral, They're, they were neutral. They weren't saying, they were just simply identifying uh, how to, or uh, the papers were about how to identify the particular metal soaps or the identification of these soaps in paintings and so forth. Um, the bottom graph shows uh, these papers that were written specifically about paintings that were made after the 1850s. And you'll note that at the very beginning, uh, before 1997, most of the papers were very positive about metal soaps. Now, the, why is this shift occurring? The shift is mainly occurring in terms of identifying, uh, it, it, it isn't like suddenly all these degradation processes appeared after 2000. That's not really not the case at all. What is the case is that they're now able to identify or beginning to identify the roles of metal soaps in paintings and uh, beginning to attribute the, uh, the, these, uh, the metal soaps to some of the defects or the degradation products that are being seen in paintings. So, uh, and, this is, and this is because they have now been using, they're using more sophisticated testing and analysis methods that uh, enable them to identify this. And so there's more information about this. And, and the information, the studies are not done. There's gonna be continue to do this and in fact, a couple years ago, there was a conference in Europe specifically about metal soaps. But in all this, we have to keep remembering that uh, although metal soaps can lead to degradation in, in paint, oil paint films, and by the way, in some cases, some of these uh, um, 
uh, some of the degradation also incurs in tempera paint films. And there is a couple of papers that I have identified that. But all in all, we have to remember that, the, that there are benefits to using especially lead in, uh, in oil paint films. Um, of course, uh, many of you are now aware that zinc oxide or zinc white forms also metal soaps. And um, in, for the large part, these metal soaps are, has been identified as having negative or adverse effects on oil paint films, uh, such as delamination and embrittlement and, and other types uh, also uh, increase transparency quite rapidly, in fact. And so this is, uh, this is of course, a grave concern, but with, with, with lead white in particular, and with uh, some other lead uh, containing pigments, we have to note that there are many benefits and, and perhaps the benefits, uh, the benefits do outweigh many of the issues. The key part is to identify the true, uh, what is really causing, which this has not been totally conclusive, but what is really causing the, these, uh, this degradation in, in the paint films. Because you have to remember that uh, there's many sources of lead in oil paint films. And what's interesting is that in the 20th century, uh, there have actually been more lead added as additives in paint films as opposed to uh, the roles that it played as a pigment in, uh, in early paintings, paintings that were done in, um, uh, in the early centuries of the Renaissance uh, and so forth. So a lot, of the, a lot of the lead was also introduced not only as dryers, but also as certain types of additives to increase the wettability of the pigment in production. And this has been done uh, primarily in, in the 20th century. So a lot of the de defects are observed in modern paintings. Uh, and, and so uh, more of this information needs to be analyzed to determine what the actual role that lead plays in terms of the source and, uh, and whether, the, uh, whether the production of these, uh, these effects or metal soaps can lead to the kind of degradation that they're seeing. So, um, so this is an important point. I wanted to bring this out to you. This paper, by the way, which is um, lead soaps uh, in paintings, friend or, friends or foe, um, can be downloaded from the internet. Uh, just look up that title and you can make it is available. It's very technical, uh, so it may be a little bit difficult reading because it goes into a lot of organic chemistry uh, and research, uh, but, uh, the, but it gives you a kind of an overview of, it's a really overview of a lot of the research that's been done. And like I pointed out, there's been hundreds and hundreds of scientific publications reporting on the effects of metal soaps. But more time will be needed to really figure out where these defects uh, could be coming from or these, the degradation in, in paint uh, paintings, in oil paintings and in tempera paintings are coming from. And uh, with time, uh, and of course, we'll be keeping you apprised of some of this research as time goes on. So let's move on to the next point, which is the lead white pigment supply and demand. So uh, the main, the main sources of lead white today pigment is, of course, uh, commercial manufacturers, both uh, in uh, Europe, United States, and, in, uh, and of course, in Asia. <clears throat> the pigments that are, uh, for, for many years, lead white pigment was perhaps the most, it, it was the most important pigment, avail uh, pigment available for, for centuries, perhaps even uh, thousands of years. And its importance in history is, is well noted, and especially in art history. Um, but in recent times, in the past 20th century, there's been a major decline in, in lead white pigment because uh, of its toxicity, of course, it posed many issues. I mean, in particular, issues of toxicity for children and uh, exposure to this uh, from to workers that are working uh, in, the, in these lead uh, uh, plants. And so this is something to be a big, big concern that we can see that uh, I, I put together. I found uh, information about lead white production. Uh, it goes all the way back to the beginning of the century. 
Uh, the source of this is the mineral yearbooks that are compiled uh, each year. Uh, uh, that also goes into the, uh, the production and consumption of many different types of minerals. And uh, this is the white lead production between 1946 and 1970 in the United States alone. So you can see that at, uh, in the beginning, actually in the beginning of the 20th century in the United States, the production of lead white pigment amounted to well over 200,000 short tons. Now a short ton is 2,000 pounds. So that's quite a lot of lead white. And that's just lead white, and that doesn't include lead for other purposes, but that's lead white. So by 1946, it declined considerably. Uh, so something uh, about 70, around 70,000 short tons. And then, and this is the reason for this is because uh, a different, different white pigments were, uh, were discovered in the 1920s. Titanium dioxide was discovered. Other white pigments such as zinc sulfide and lithopone uh, were improved upon so that they actually became better types of pigments used in paint. But the real discovery was the titanium dioxide. The titanium white proved to be a very opaque pigment and had lots of usages. It wasn't without problems, however, because initially when they introduced titanium white, uh, it had a photocatalytic response to light and uh, in paint films so that it, uh, it often degraded, and especially the initial forms that were introduced into paint. Later on, um, in the, uh, about the time of uh, the Second World War, they, started, they introduced a different form of titanium dioxide, the rutile form, and improved on its, um, uh, on its uh, uh, light fastness. And, uh, and so that about the, the 1940s and 50s, uh, they began coating these pigments so that it vastly improved on its usability in paint. And therefore, as a result of that, there was a very set decline, as you can see, during the Second World War, and it continued on until the 1970s. And finally, in about the 1970s is when uh, there was officially banned in many industrial countries, that is, lead white was banned. And so um, after that point, by the way, there's practically no information on the industry of the production of lead white. And the reason is because the number of manufacturers uh, dwindled to just a couple. Uh, obviously because, as you can see, the, the, um, the number of commercial uses uh, became less and less for lead white pigment, and, and hence there was fewer manufacturers. So there's really, I couldn't find much data after that point because um, the data that could have been supplied would have compromised uh, the proprietary information of the few manufacturers that left, that were just left making this pigment. And to today, there's only a couple of manufacturers in North America. Um, a couple, some years ago, I believe it was about six years ago, uh, the one manufacturer in Europe, which was located in England, uh, stopped producing lead white. And so uh, lead white production uh, had to be switched to other sources or uh, for or lead white oil paint had to be the source for that pigment had to be switched to other sources and the price of course because of the dwindling commercial uses for lead white uh, the prices have gone uh, quite a bit higher right now the only as far as I know there's probably um, uh, there's two types of lead white being manufactured basically today one type of lead white is not as necessarily as a pigment but as a chemical additive used in certain types of, um, of chemical processes. And of course, the other type is, is definitely a pigment. The, the difference has to do with uh, the, the purity, um, somewhat of the purity, but mostly about particle size. Because using, uh, using lead white as a chemical additive, uh, the requirement there for particle size is perhaps not as stringent. But as, uh, as a pigment, of course, the particle size is critical. In other words, the particle size range needs to be quite narrow. Uh, so that today, most of the manufacturers in um, uh, making lead white pigment 
have a, an average particle size of about three microns. So with that, then prices have jumped. And just this year, prices jumped uh, considerably. And in some cases, up to four times the amount uh, from some of the pigment manufacturers. So this has posed a major problem for artist materials manufacturers who are trying to make and supply lead white oil paint to artists. Just they're, we're forced to raise our prices because we have no choice because we have to obtain lead white from these companies. And in fact, now these companies really, they're only keeping lead white production mainly for artist materials manufacturers which is a remarkable thing because the amount of lead white sold throughout the world for artist materials manufacturers is, is um, barely registers. Um, and, and so it's such a small amount. As a result, this year, some of the manufacturers have, um, and, and as a necessity, had to change from a uh, regular production of producing lead white to producing it on scheduled basis depending on demand. And so quite difficult to do so. And so at the beginning of, uh, of this year, uh, uh, the manufacturers decided to hold off production until August. As a result of that, um, <clears throat> a lot of the companies had enough supply to make paint for up to a period of time. Uh, in natural pigments, we had enough to make paint up until about August and in which case we fell short. The good news is, is that they've, uh, they, they finally did uh, resume uh, manufacturing and we do have a shipment of lead white coming in as we speak and we expect to have it soon and we'll be producing lead white again uh, uh, shortly. Uh, we expect to have, we were expecting to have it earlier. Uh, we we're expecting to have it this month, but it uh, looks like it won't be available until uh, the end of October. So in the future, we may be expecting shortages and disruption of supplies. And I'm, not, and I'm not recommending that artists go into a frenzy and start buying lead white like uh, we saw uh, the, the purchase of, of toilet paper during COVID. I do not recommend that all at all because that will only increase the number of issues going on. Uh, we're going to be doing a number of things to ensure that there's going to be a steady supply. We're in discussions with the pigment manufacturers to, co to coordinate better uh, the, the supply of uh, lead white so that we could be making it. So like I mentioned, we are going to have lead white, uh, modern lead white, and I'm going to make a distinction of that in just a moment, uh, available in late October. There is going to be a price increase. We're going to be deciding that uh, in the next uh, week or so, what that increase will look like. Um, but uh, that's the, the bad news for everybody, but uh, we know how important this lead white is and um, we're going to try to minimize the impact for artists. So what is Natural Pigments doing about all this? Like I mentioned, we are looking at um, coordinating the results with the pigment manufacturer. We still rely on them and we will continue to rely on them. Um, and we're all looking at new sources uh, but these aren't pigmentary, pigment sources of lead white. These are chemical additive sources of lead white. And we're, we've been uh, evaluating them to use as a pigment. Um, and we're doing some studies right now to determine that. Um, some of them look interesting, but they also have certain types of issues. So we're, we're going to try to work with that and see what we can come up with, uh, mostly as a backup rather than as our main source. And the other thing that we've, um, we've been able to do is to increase the in-house production of stack process flake white. Now, during COVID, we, because of um, our responsibility to our employees to keep them safe from COVID uh, during this pandemic period, so we had to stop, temporarily stop our production of stack process flake white. Um, and we needed to rearrange how we're producing it. And so we've actually invested some more into this, into the process. And that's what we're doing now. Um, we've actually produced a batch and, uh, I'm, uh, I'm announcing this for the very first time to the public. Um, 
and, um, uh, and so it is now going to be available to you. And, um, and we've actually now, we've, uh, we've put into effect an increase in the production of stack process. And in fact, we're hoping, uh, and we probably will be able to do this, to in, uh, have it uh, supplied on a regular basis from this point forward. You know that many times we were out, and of course in the past uh, a year and a half it was uh, because of COVID, um, but primarily, but in other times uh, the, the production was more difficult. It's a very labor intensive process. And I'd like to describe what that process is now so that uh, some of you um, have, uh, have, have read some of the articles on, uh, about the stack, uh, the historical production of stack process flake white and how it differs from that of modern lead white, which is in our, our regular range of lead white um, products. But um, I also wanted to show you a little bit about that. There is an article on the Natural Pigments website called Stack Process uh, White Lead, the Historical Method of Manufacture. And I encourage you to read it. It's a very detailed article. It goes through the entire history of making lead white from its very beginning. Uh, and so, and let me just mention that the, the pigment lead white has, uh, as far as we know in, in art, always been from a synthetic source. In other words, it was made by, by humans uh, and apparently from early Greek times. Uh, some of the earliest, the earliest uh, examples of it are in literature by uh, Pliny the Elder, who wrote about it in his book, A Natural History, and he describes the process of making it, which by the way, essentially did not change from early Greek time until the beginning of the 20th century when uh, manufacturers began using a modern method of making lead white. And this modern method of lead white differs dramatically from the stack process, mostly due to the crystal formation of the lead white as well as the particle size. Here's some uh, interesting uh, drawings from patents on uh, lead white production. Uh, these are US patents from the 19th century. Uh, the, the, the drawing on the left shows a clay pot that was used. And by the way, this clay pot, the example of this clay pot is almost, uh, almost identical or very similar to the types of clay pots used uh, by the Dutch. Now the Dutch improved significantly or standardized the method of making lead white. And that's why sometimes the stack process is also called the old Dutch method. So in about the 16th, 17th centuries, the Dutch were, was, uh, they were making lead white in, uh, uh, in a large way. And they standardize on this production. And we know about this because there are uh, some accounts in literature about the production of lead white back then. And it's, uh, they're very detailed. And so we know a lit, uh, quite a bit about how they produced it. And at Natural Pigments, we used the same basic method uh, that was done in, uh, in, by the Dutch by the 16th century and reproduced it um, in, in our own factory where we now make lead white. Uh, also on the, on the right side is a drawing of one of these lead white sheds where uh, the stack process was done. Now, the reason why it's called the stack process and, and the Dutch really were the ones that started this is that um, the lead, so the, and, and the innovations that the, that the Dutch introduced was that the, that the Dutch cast lead into thin sheets and then uh, coiled the sheets into spirals and placed them inside vertically inside those clay pots. And so the clay pot, as you can see here, the lead would have sat right on here. It sits on a little bit of a lip uh, or somehow is, is kept above this area. And in this area, this is filled with vinegar. So uh, the vinegar sits down here, the lead doesn't touch it. And then these clay pots are lined up inside this uh, corroding shed. 
And, uh, and initially they call this a blue stack because the color of the lead, the lead has a kind of a bluish gray, uh, the metallic lead does have a bluish gray appearance to it. And so these pots were placed in rows and columns and then between the pots was horse manure. And I know that sounds quite odd to many of you. Uh, later on, of course, uh, they used other materials such as tan bark, but horse manure was, was used primarily by the Dutch. And this is again, one of the uh, innovations. There was different sources of heat and carbon dioxide and water that were introduced by, uh, by, previ in, by previous manufacturing in, in earlier centuries. But the Dutch uh, standardized on the use of horse manure and the use uh, and and putting this into rooms where uh, where the corrosion would take effect. So what happens is, and this is on the left side is a picture of this. You can see the metal coils. You can see the clay pots. We uh, in some of our initial research we just, uh, because some of the information wasn't very particular in terms of what kind of clay. We, um, we used different types of clay pots or clay in these pots, uh, these ceramic pots, uh, which were typically unglazed except for the bottom of the pot, which contained the vinegar. And, um, and so we did many different types of experimentation with that. We also closed, you can see some of the pots have lids on them here. And so, and so we closed them to determine if, uh, if that made any difference in the corrosion process. But within really a very quick amount of time, the corrosion process began. And the purpose, by the way, of the manure is that it needs to, uh, you need to generate heat so that this, these, these rooms would become quite warm. And uh, so it generates heat. It also generates water vapor and it generates carbon dioxide. Those are the essential ingredients to this whole process. And so the first part is that the, that the acetic acid in the vinegar attacks the metallic lead. And then this is uh, a, not a stable form of, it's also known as sugar of lead or lead acetate. And it's then converted into uh, a basic lead carbonate, which actually consists of two components, which is lead hydroxide and, uh, uh, and lead carbonate. And that's what makes uh, lead white. And you can see how these rolls here within a few weeks, this is of course a little more advanced. Um, you can see that they become, um, uh, the, the corrosion effect uh, it becomes quite dramatic. And the, um, as, the, as the lead is corroding, it, it continues into the roll so that the, in some cases, the entire uh, roll is, is consumed in the process. Uh, when you pick up these, um, uh, these lead rolls, they, uh, the, the lead uh, actually flakes off. And that's where they get the term flake white, by the way. So only uh, pigment, lead white pigment made in this form should actually be called flake white because that's the form it actually comes in, in during the corrosion process. Most, of course, artist material companies call their lead white flake white. And so there is this confusion whether they're making a stack process or not. But I can assure you that um, these manufacturers are not. They're, they're, they're actually just using a modern lead white, which is now done through an entirely different process. It's, uh, it's either an electrolytic process or it's a, a chemical precipitation process uh, done with uh, carbon dioxide in a bath of, um, of acetic acid and a litharge. So very different process and the result is quite different. Here is an example, and I've shown this quite often in some of the classes that we've done. I've shown it, uh, you know, because a lot, of, a lot of people ask, well, what's the difference between, and, and of course, it's a much higher price for the stack process, uh, flake white. And so what's really the difference between the two? So this is a, uh, this is a video from uh, um, uh, Van, uh, Van Wiedering's uh, video about Rembrandt and they were comparing modern lead white with uh, stack process lead white. Now on the right side of this is modern lead white. And then on the left side is the stack process lead white. 
and you're going to see a very big difference. Now, the, the two pigments were ground in, uh, in the same oil so that there's really no difference there. So the difference is in terms of their behavior is in, uh, uh, has to do with the particle uh, shape and size of uh, the stack process. So note here, and you can see buttery paint, kind of what you'd expect from modern pigments. And now notice here, uh, the, the individual is tapping just the top of the paint with, uh, with the palette knife and notice the behavior of the lead white in this particular example. And you can see that it begins to flow as energy is put in, sheer uh, force is put into it. Now notice as soon as that he stops doing that and, and the energy is removed, the, it stops flowing and it freezes into position. This kind of behavior for a pseudoplastic substance like paint uh, is called thixotropic behavior. And that's really an ideal behavior for paint because when you brush the paint or you manipulate the paint with the palette knife, you want the paint to flow, especially with the brush. You want, you want the paint to flow with the brush and not have to keep picking it up and dragging it. You know, I call it shoveling paint. And so what happens is you, with thixotropic paint, like the stack process here, uh, is you can move it and it flows with the brush. But as soon as you stop moving it with the brush or the palette knife, it stays into position. It doesn't keep flowing and leveling out. And so that's really the property, the thixotropic property and the benefit of the stack process lead white. And there's other benefits too. Um, there, there is some indication that the particle size may have other benefits in terms of the formation or the lack of formation or the delay of formation of lead soaps, which may be an incredibly important thing as we're going to be discovering. So the good news is Stack Process Flake White is available today on our website. And if you, uh, and I'll put the link to it uh, in, um, in the comments later. And if you're interested, you can obtain it now. So we have the production available now and, um, and it's a limited production at this point in time. Uh, but like I said, we're going to be, we have another stack that's uh, in process and or another batch that is actually going to be in process and we'll have that available and the lead white pigment also if those inter those individuals interested in obtaining lead white now this is only available right now through uh, naturalpigments.com and our distribution play, uh, point in the united states um, uh, unfortunately that's the only place we can we can sell at this point in time but if you're interested you can get it from there so So that's the overall information about that. And um, let me see. And I, I failed to re remark that uh, Tatiana Zaitseva is, is with me. And, um, and by the way, uh, I want everybody to wish her a happy birthday. Today is everybody her birthday. Did. Oh, good. <laughs> everybody before you. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank and you. Um, very so, um, nice. so this is, uh, so, Tanya, what, uh, what kind of questions should we consider here? Uh, so let's go back to actually the toxicity. Wow, so there's, a, the, there's one in Russian too. That's pretty. I know. And that's I, great. Will specific, I already talked to Dmitry. Uh, uh, okay, no bad, great. And, Thanks, so, Dmitry, and, for joining. Yes, and I, uh, um, he has specific questions and I will answer afterwards. But sure. let's, uh, let's talk about toxicity first. And so I do want you address that. Okay, um, okay, so basically toxicity. So I've written some information about this, not only uh, in natural pigments, but also on the paintingbestpractices.com website and uh, about toxicity. There's concerns, of course, uh, and the important thing to understand is to really understand, uh, uh, and this is important for, I, I can't emphasize this enough that artists should be reading the safety data sheets of the materials that they're using in the studio so they can have a clear understanding of all of the products. And one of the things that uh, we should always assume is that there is no such thing as non-toxic. 
because, uh, and, the, and unfortunately the term is often used in a marketing way uh, without very little regulation so that, uh, just to give you an example, something that may be considered to be non-toxic in one form or application is clearly uh, not so in a different application. So that's an important point to note. And, and um, one of the things I, I talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, is about spike oil. A lot of people call it, of course, it is generally considered uh, or regarded as safe, called GRAS, generally regarded as safe, and is considered to be non-toxic. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that that substance or that designation is given to it in its most common applications, which is in aromatherapy and as in scents and perfumes and in food. So there they use minuscule amounts of, the, of that product. And so it is at that point generally regarded as being safe. However, the way artists are using it as a solvent may introduce a whole different uh, level of concern and toxicity uh, in that form. And so in, that's just an example of what I'm talking about here. So we obviously know the dangers and, and uh, the toxicity of lead, and we will never uh, underplay that. Uh, I, I never do that. And so I always encourage artists to definitely protect themselves from uh, being exposed to it. But keep in mind that, that lead white in, in, um, in the form of paint, not in powder form, which poses a whole new set of issues, um, uh, can be safely handled. And, and of course, the way to safely handle it is to, is to the, the best way to do that is to wear gloves. And um, there, are, there are no vapors emitted from lead white oil paint. So you don't have to wear a respirator to do that. Um, avoid sanding paint uh, or causing any kind of dust or heating it up in some way so that you can avoid then creating a vapor of it. But at normal uh, temperature and uh, in normal studio use, it doesn't pose that kind of problem. And so the main thing to do is to avoid ingesting it. And, and that's relatively easy to do. We just don't put it in our mouth. And, and that's why when you use it, always wash your hands carefully uh, even if you are wearing gloves, uh, you want to wash your hands afterwards. And, uh, but especially if you decide not to do that, you definitely want to wash your hands thoroughly and make sure you get under your nails to remove all traces of that. Also, <clears throat> you might want to consider using products um, that certain soaps that remove uh, lead from surfaces. And one of the biggest dangers in any kind of toxic product, in use of toxic product, in a uh, studio or work environment is what I call secondary contamination. In other words, when you're using the product, you're aware of the product and you, you are certain to avoid ingesting or to put like putting your hands in your mouth or in your nose or your ear or something of this nature. Um, and so you're aware of that and you definitely avoid that. But if you fail to clean the surfaces, such as perhaps a table where you were mixing on or some of your tools and you fail to clean it well and then you go back with uh, ungloved hand and unaware that there is the, these items are present there, you then can ingest uh, some lead at that point. So, um, and that's what I call secondary contamination. So to avoid that, simply clean the surfaces and tools that you're using and also uh, use, uh, there's, uh, there's a kit, we sell it on our website, um, but it's available from many other locations. It's a lead test kit, uh, very easy to use. It, uh, all, it just involves uh, two components, uh, A and B part. You spray the A onto a cotton swab and you spray the B part onto, this, onto the cotton swab. And then you, then you uh, wipe that on any surface where you suspect lead is, even if there's even if the lead is invisible and it's just, you know, just uh, a microscopic amount of it there, it will turn a bright yellow. So that's an indication that there's some lead there and it's always good. We use it in our factory after, after we clean up and we wipe down all the surfaces 
And once a month, we we do uh, we do an audit where we we go through the factory and we just we just take it and wipe off door handles, phones, everything like that, just to determine if uh, if there's any lead present. We've never found lead present in other items. Uh, only in some cases in the work area, there might have been after a cleanup, there might have been some lead present. And that's why we do that in order to ensure that it's thoroughly clean and there's no secondary contamination. This is very easy to do and um, doesn't require, you know, all, you know, scientific knowledge and so forth. It, it's now so easy to avoid becoming uh, exposed to lead. And again, we need to emphasize that lead should only be used by adults who can read uh, the safety information on the label of paint and the safety data sheets and uh, should not be used by minors or adults that are incapable of understanding the instructions on how to use these things. So this is a very important part. We want to emphasize that all the time to artists. Now, I do want to go back a little bit and say that um, we do understand um, uh, some of you absolutely love it, love uh, lead white and absolutely understand why is that important, but some of you absolutely not. So, and we understand that and we respect that. And that's why we are telling you. So if you don't want to le use the lead white, it's absolutely okay. These days we do have other white colors, which people in previous centuries didn't. So some of them, unfortunately, don't give the same, same, same ability. Same benefits yes. in oil. Thing. Yes, yeah. so mm -hmm. in oil, yes, again, let's emphasize, and it's only it's on oil. Oils. That's what we're talking about. And uh, so, and uh, if lead white is not for you, so uh, it's okay too. So, but uh, we do have uh, now in our company, which if you will ask me, uh, five years ago, I will absolutely swear and tell you then we would not touch titanium. But again, even titanium, we make a um, certain way what uh, many of you know, then we don't put any additives. So I will let the, I mean, I'm sorry, titanium will behave completely different. And uh, I do know it's, uh, it was a couple questions about will titanium lead uh, behave the same, slightly different, but again, it will be as long we already covered that in September session, uh, uh, first part of the, uh, when we talk about lead whites. The second part will be uh, here in October coming and I will cover all our pure leads, single pigments, because in September it was uh, mixes and it was historical mixes as, long, as much as um, actually titanium. But so, um, Stay tuned for October, and uh, I just now, since I took the word from George, so I just want to to thank all of you here, and uh, and especially ones who try to even to write in Russian and uh, or with uh, with Russian um, translator. So. Thank you very much. It's a very uh, nice day for me started uh, today. So, and uh, another question I had, why do we call uh, our line of colors Rublev? And uh, it's actually come up uh, very logical. Uh, we started as uh, uh, our company as a natural pigments because we wanted to give uh, artists different sets of pigments, not synthetic modern co colors but colors what were used by um, uh, in uh, in uh, previous centuries and f fortunately uh, for us uh, we just uh, basically um, you know attempt uh, all all historical colors but very quickly we understood and we can't just uh, call the natural uh, pigments so then under natural pigments you can read its historical colors because lead white is not natural and some of the very important historical colors are not natural so it's why we call natural historical too and uh, the name rublev come uh, again logical because our a company we started as a non-profit organization it's called iconophile with iconographers 
and to take the name Rublev, who was 15th century artist, uh, iconographer, monk. And so he, uh, he painted the probably the most important um, uh, icons, uh, not only for Russians in, in Orthodox uh, world, but for whole world. Um, it's Trinity, and uh, so it's called Tri uh, Rublev Trinity. And so since we were working first, probably like three to five years, only strictly with uh, iconographers who paint uh, um, Ek Tempera, so we took that name. And of course, when we started make our uh, oil colors much later, so we decided just to drag that name with us. And I do understand it's a little bit upsetting for Russians because in Russia, you can't take that name because it, it was historical um, person. I mean, it's historical name uh, for real person who exists. And so uh, by law in Russia, you can't. And here um, it's, um, you know, unusual case where here in in United States we took Russian name, but it is uh, American company. We we make our all our colors we make here, so that's the the answer. And it's not to emphasize the uh, historical aspects. It's not the the case, and it's not why we did this. It just happened like this. And it's also to honor the that great Absolutely. artist. And so Absolutely. So it was a great artist. Um, and we wanted to honor his uh, his memory. Um, there was a, a question. I know um, Nick is already writing three times. Let's uh, answer that one, so, Nick. So Nick, we um, do prepare. We are preparing right now. Cinnabar. It will be available. You yes yes. So so, <laughs> so yeah. The um, we have a production of Cinnabar uh, going through our our process now. And uh, this is it's a it's a very nice pigment. And by the way, for those of you who do not know this, but vermilion is red mercuric sulfide. It is a synthetic red mercuric sulfide, and is uh, the most important bright red pigment in history. Uh, and so we, um, uh, but cine, uh, excuse me, ver that's what vermilion is—a synthetic form and is probably the most common form of that pigment in, in historical painting. But um, uh, to, to, uh, cinnabar is the natural mineral, so in its natural state, and, um, and that uh, particular mineral is also red mercuric sulfide. So we're gonna be, inter we're gonna be introducing a, a paint um, uh, that can be used uh, in place of, of vermilion. So, uh, it, and that is cinnabar. So look for that uh, probably, I would suspect by uh, November timeframe, we'll have some of that available. Um, was there other uh, yes. questions? Here's the Uncle 60 is as asking if... Um, so what happens when I mix lead white with the regular titanium white? Uh, that one, so I basically answered it. Okay. Uh, it will be more a peg. So and a little and brighter, more yes. uh, more opacity and brighter, yeah. and uh, there's some advantages but, in doing that, especially if you want. Uh, but read the other one, George. Greater next opacity. one after that. The next one. Um, let me see. So you oh, scrape will, the you scrape the uh, it, white flakes. Yeah. Will it flow if I mix it? Yes. Uh, but but again, keep in mind that the modern lead white does not have the same characteristics as the stacked process lead white. And, and when you, what well, we've noticed that when you add uh, titanium, titanium has uh, unfortunately very poor body in, um, uh, in oil paint. And so, and that's why it's often and, and probably the most common form rather than making a tube of pure titanium pigment, uh, uh, they often put other, a filler into it. Of course, uh, uh, most companies at one point were using zinc white uh, to to counter it and so uh, to counter some of the poor body as well uh, as the the color of the, of the titanium because the titanium actually also yellows and um, and so uh, zinc white actually prevents that but and that's the one benefit of zinc white but unfortunately it it has this terrible effect of making oil paint very brittle and uh, so that's why um, um, that's why 
it will not have the same flow characteristics uh, when you when you mix the two together. So while you're reading the last one, I will answer for Uncle Sixty Which? another one. So I I even uh, uh, repost for you, George Uncle Thirty. You scrape the white flakes of the lead when grind the fl uh, the flakes. Any other uh, fillers uh, added it to uh, as a white chalk? Absolutely not. Not in stack in the stack lead. process. Yes. No. Oui. No. There are um, there. Of course, historically, they often the pigment manufacturers often adulterated these pigments. They uh, initially, um, I mean, very early on. Um, they, they used chalk to adulterate it. Then later in the, um, in the 19th century, they used barium sulfate or barite to adulterate these pigments. And unbeknownst to the artists, they would sell it as pure lead white, but it already had, was already adulterated, which was unfortunate. Uh, so that was always an issue. But uh, no, we don't, uh, we don't put anything else in the stack lead white. It's just pure oil and stack pigment. And another question from uh, Uncle Sixty: Do you make uh, lead any other colors? Absolutely. If all companies in the world are trying right now to <clears throat> go from away from heavy metals, we are going back to lead uh, lead colors. We do have a range of lead uh, lead colors. Please visit our website naturalpigments.com, and um, uh, you can find on a um, range of white colors uh, in oil. It's very easy to find, or you can just uh, type on the uh, search on the right uh, right corner of the screen. There was a, a question here: When you pull the brush off, will this paint leave desired peaks? And if you're referring to, of course, the stack process, yes, it it will. Uh, you can manipulate it in such a way where it can do certain things. And again, a lot of this will depend batch to batch because again, it's because of the way this is made and this has always been the case with stack process lead white. Um, you know, there was always variability. So the effects that you may see in one batch may be different in an another batch. Jose Alan Medina, uh, are the uh, modern methods to make lead white too hard to make in a smaller scale? You cannot believe. My husband actually started think about this. And so he, I think by December, he already <laughs> is trying to produce first batch based on modern methods. So you are looking right in target. <laughs> Uh, there is another qu question here. Is there any benefit in just using lead ground versus using a lead white throughout a painting? Well, if you understand what a lead ground is, uh, lead grounds typically are formulated with uh, extender pigments in order to increase the absorbency of the ground. And so, whereas you, you can use a lead ground throughout uh, a painting, there probably is very little advantage in doing that in particular. Uh, because you may not need or even desire have the desire uh, or want to have a uh, an additional or increased absorbency throughout the painting because this actually could lead to sinking in. Um, Connie, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, let me let me do this one. Another one from Marsha. Okay. Is is it correct to say that the pigment size of stack white is too large to pass through the skin? Well, actually. Uh, this would be true for any pigment. The, the pigments, uh, except for perhaps nanoparticle pigments, uh, and they don't actually pass through the, nanoparticles actually don't pass through the skin, but they can actually enter a cell wall. Uh, and that's why uh, th they were at one point introducing titanium white and nanoparticles as a invisible, um, uh, the ultraviolet light uh, absorber or uh, as a screen uh, sk skin I'm trying to look for the word uh, uh, skin protection from light and um, uh, and so they they couldn't they couldn't release that because of course they found the titanium white passing through the cell walls but pigments themselves do not pass through the skin the skin has many layers and by the way there's an article about this uh, about skin absorption of, of pigment particles uh, on the Painting Best Practice website. I talk about that. It's unlikely that pigment particles 
will, or any paint will pass through your skin uh, because there are seven layers of skin that offer this kind of protection. Uh, the only way to do this is if, uh, if you had a break in your skin, abrasion or a cut, uh, and then it could be, and then it could expose your, uh, your blood vessels, in which case then you would absorb uh, some, some of that lead. Uh, but lead is, is not easily absorbed through the skin at all. Um, there may be certain conditions where it can be because in, in fact, lead is, is not soluble in water or not easily soluble in water, unless there is, of course, other things present like acids where it de de then can be uh, dissolved in the water. Um, another question, Tanya, Here's, uh, that you yes, saw? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Connie, uh, what is the difference between flake uh, lead white and lead white number one? Connie, uh, we will have a session on October 13th here in YouTube and in Facebook uh, about, uh, it's specifically we will talk about uh, uh, these colors, but on short answer will be stuck lead has a different particle size and lead uh, because lead white number one is modern lead white and stuck lead we are making here um, on old by old methods so here's another question from elizabeth uh, is it safe to accidentally ingest titanium uh, oil linseed no lead asking for very messy students they will in, not in, die ingesting <laughs> titanium <laughs> yes um, well, titanium is used in food, although yes. not the not the the, the Best. pigments that we that is commonly. So there are certain pigments uh, or titanium pigments that are made are then approved by the FDA, and then they, they can be used in food. But the pigments used in uh, in paint is not that type. And uh, although I don't know of any toxicity, although in the state of California. Uh, it is listed as uh, as a hazardous substance in Prop 65, but that is, the hazard comes through breathing large amounts or inhaling large amounts of titanium powder. So that's, and again, that's why it's important to read safety data sheets so you can understand, you know, because people read titanium, oh, you know, which is every you know everywhere in every product, and then they think it's it's actually toxic, but it's only toxic in certain forms. Um, there's another question here from yes. Max. Uh -huh. <clears throat> How does cinnabar compare with lead in terms of toxicity? Um, because, uh, so again, uh, cinnabar and vermilion are both, uh, and by the way, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a toxicologist. So, um, so we do recommend always consulting with your doctor or your toxicologist in all cases so that you have a clear understanding of what's going on. Those are the experts. But what I do say and, and what I can say from our own studies and our own findings is that um, that there is uh, cinnabar and vermilion are considered to be toxic substances, but not as toxic as perhaps even lead uh, and, and certainly not as toxic as, as the metal mercury. And um, there's an article that I wrote in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Natural Pigments website. We talk about the toxicity of vermilion and uh, through actual testing that we did with the John Hopkins University. And so we found that it, it doesn't, under certain conditions, it doesn't dissolve in the types of acids found in stomachs. But, however, we don't know everything that goes on in a stomach. And so, we do not recommend eating cinnabar or ingesting it in any form whatsoever. But uh, because it's a sulfide, it does present less toxicity overall. Um, is there another question? So, yes, here? here's uh, Catherine Devilla. Uh, is the supply of lead uh, tin yellow affected also? No. Catherine, uh, we buy our <clears throat> lead tin yellow from one small company uh, in Europe, and they historically were making this uh, in very small batches anyway. So uh, that will not affect, and so it will not affect the price of that uh, pigment too. So we, we still continue. And you see, who know, guys who know us for so many years, you know then George, is going out of his way so to figure out 
pigments for you because when you know vermilion was growing in price and um you know we still were keeping saying at least prices for so now we lost vermilion so he is believe <clears throat> or not he's trying to figure out now how to make vermilion here it will probably take for him some time to just to make this safely uh here on the but uh, we still, uh, we, I'm sure he will figure out uh, some way. But on meanwhile, we will sell cinnabar. And Dmitri, you are right. So then, uh, light fastness of the uh, PR83 of the uh, cinnabar is uh, a little. Yeah, so a, 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 a lizard and crimson. Oh, he's talking about lizard and crimson. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, we that's, are not talking. Okay. That's PR eighty three. Oh eighty three. Yeah. Well, one of uh, one. one of so it's it's yeah. co completely different. So. But that's yes. of course lizard crimson is not yes. a natural pigment. Uh, yes. Uh, but it and is it is not as light fast and of course that's been well recognized. And cinnabar as uh, as the vermilion reacting uh, again uh, different and you absolutely right uh, because I misunderstood and so the in certain cases. Vermilion and cinnabar are darkened in history. It 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 happened not that many times. Then just to just to in order to avoid that pig, pigment completely, it's not worth it. It's beautiful, beautiful red pigment. So another question: Flemish white is produced by modern method. Yes, Flemish white is basically lead sulfate. So it's not a it's not lead white. It's not uh, there in our Flemish white. And by the way, Flemish white is is not a pigment, it's just a name that was adopted in the uh, 19th century to designate lead sulfate, which is very different from lead white. So just keep that in mind. But this, uh, the lead sulfate that we use in our Flemish white is a modern method. Um, so, uh, okay, let's go on to another ben, question. Ben? ben, yeah, okay. Valentine. Uh, would non-visible traces of lead paint, f lead from paint, still be dangerous? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I painted with lead for years, but still have paranoia about non-visible traces. And well, that's where, that's what I recommended is to you know get a lead test kit to determine whether there's lead available. And also, it's a good idea to have a um, have your blood tested for lead just to make sure that um, you know that you're being safe and that you're following recommended procedures so we always encourage this uh, we never want to have any of our artists uh, become ill as a result of uh, of the toxicity of lead um george i reposted for uh, for brecht okay you're uh, the see. last one you can look in my so. okay could you um, elaborate on the metal soaps and uh, modern lead white? You mentioned a difference uh, um, concerning metal soaps between stuck and modern lead. It's actually not with, uh, with stuck and modern, but it's uh, more, so, la more likely lead and zinc. So, so both of these pigments. So metal soaps can originate from uh, a, a number of different types of pigments. And I mentioned zinc is one, lead white, and uh, and it also lead tin yellow as and uh, has been noted to have uh, metal soaps or to to create or form metal soaps, but also metal soaps come from other sources such as litharge, uh, and black oil uh, is a is a um, um, is a source of lead soaps. In fact, that's basically what it, what it consists of: uh, oil and some lead soaps. And, um, and the study that I mentioned uh, determined, for instance, that lead soaps will form from litharge in walnut oil at room temperature in a, in a short period of time and uh, at elevated temperatures almost immediately. So which, of course, is how black oil is made. So the formation of these lead soaps can occur or metal soaps can occur from that. And again, I want to emphasize the fact that we still don't understand completely. We do know that lead soaps can lead to degradation, but we do not understand exactly the role of uh, the, the, or the, and the intent, of course, how artists were using or adding these materials or the manufacturers adding these materials. You know, as an example, um, 
uh, manufacturers have added um, uh, stair rates uh, into these um, uh, into oil paints since the beginning of the 20th century. And the stair rates do form soaps with many of these materials. And, uh, and this is, by the way, some of the lead soaps they're found are actually stair rates as well as soaps from oleic acid and palmitic acids. So, um, so this is also part of this whole issue. And again, the understanding of this is not complete at this point in time. And until uh, we, we do understand more, you know, we'll, we'll be able to get a better handle on how these things uh, can occur. I, I, I know Virgil listening, thank you Virgil, for uh, reminding that metal soaps from stabilizers, uh, that, is, that is of course part of the problem. Part of the problem is the efflorescence that they, that do occur as a result of uh, these kinds of meds, uh, metal soaps. Um, and uh, let uh, me see So here. here's uh, uh, Ben, uh, he said, and I got tested, re tested oh. recently and was well uh, below standard. I, we actually encourage you, if you do paint with lead, and so instead of sleepless nights, just go to doctor. It's very easy uh, check. Or if you don't want to go to doctor about, so now they have even saliva tests. It's very easy again. So you send, you take your saliva, you send to lab, and lab will uh, will notify you by email actually when when it's ready. So I can tell you this: George works with pigments. Pigment. Uh, lead white tons of year and uh, and uh, one our one of our employees just dedicated to lead white only and so uh, we test them yearly year. mm -hmm. and uh, and even with the pigment their uh, blood test is uh, uh, below than even like uh, children's norm so for those of you who even have a question don't don't hesitate just go and check yourself and so then th that will just make you you know uh, feel better if if so and by the way these days we actually do have um, methods of cleaning uh, body from the lead and so it's very painful <laughs> very costly but it still uh, could be done so then if if that is your concern Okay, so we um, have, um, there was a question okay. about, uh, we, we didn't talk about the toxicity of cadmiums. Yes. Uh, again, it's next program. <laughs> that's, that's probably something we can, we can talk about later. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind about this is that uh, the um, cadmiums have been classified as a uh, class 1B carcinogen, which means that when animals are tested, uh, with this pigment, they developed cancer, and um, and so uh, this uh, class one B carcinogens doesn't necessarily, although it may be an indication, doesn't necessarily mean that humans develop uh, cancer as a result of the use of cadmiums. But again, the cadmium is an cadmium sulfide, and sulfide pigments are much less, uh, much ha have much less bioavailability to the body as opposed to cadmiums in other forms. And by the way, the largest form or usage of cadmiums today is in, of course, your phones and in computers where you have nickel cadmium battery being used in many, many areas. So uh, the pigment represents the, uh, in, in the industry really, the least danger to, uh, to humans today. Um, let me see okay, here, so, uh, another question do we want to, um, uh, I, I saw something there, in uh, Facebook, actually, we, uh, we didn't. Uh, so. There's a question, uh, not this is about white, uh, but someday do you produce a violet oil paint similar to colors of cobalt or doxazine? Yes, we are going to be producing a cobalt violet. Uh, we do will not produce a dioxazine purple uh, or any kind of uh, organic pigments we may in the future. But at this point in time, because of the recent, um, uh, recent information in regards to the standards for the testing standards for light fastness in artist paints, we uh, we decided not to produce these pigments until 
this standard has been revised and, and, and the testing has been revised. Right now, there is a big question, and I'm not saying that organic pigments are not light fast, but what we are saying is we actually don't know which ones are light fast and not based on information that the ASTM uh, subcommittee on artist materials have been considering during the past couple of years in which uh, I've, I've talked about this extensively to groups of artists and, uh, and we urge, and I just wanted to say this, we urge the other manufacturers besides just natural pigments and golden artist colors to get on board with this and help in revising the standard and doing the tests. Um, and uh, I do know uh, Virgil is talking very, um, very often on his page about the light fastness too, about this um, concern. So uh, thank you, Virgil. And uh, I know you uh, support us on, on this uh, aspect. And uh, Elaine Davis, Flam Flemish white is produced by Modern Method as well. I answered that one. Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah, good. that's fine. Okay. Um, okay, so... so yeah, I, I think uh, I'm trying to look through some of our, our questions here. Um, so again, reminder, today um, StockLed is open uh, for uh, public. We, uh, we send the news, uh, I mean, we send the uh, uh, notices to people who waited uh, over a year. So then uh, who wanted to buy before already bought. And so today it's uh, for, um, you know, for public and uh, lead white number one and number two will be available probably after October 15th. So we will try to do this right about because in October 13th, we will have a, uh, another session part two lead whites and uh, pale uh, pale shade of whites. Yes, is that how it was called? It's AMA. So yes, uh, uh, so I, I forgot the date. October 13th. October 13th, um, Tanya, uh, art, artist, artist Material Advisor, will talk on the subject, the, a paler shade of white, which is the second part of what we discussed in September. And we're gonna focus on LEDs and we're gonna show you all the different lead whites that we make and uh, how they perform, the opacity, and uh, we'll have more information. And of course, uh, we'll be closer to the date of when it will be available. So we'll have probably even better news for all of you at that point in time. So um, uh, I wanna thank you for, for, for participating here. And, um, and thank and, you for my congratulations. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll be seeing you in in a short while. Thank you.